Um, Senator Eaton, we have a David Bredin or Bredin next. Is that who you have in mind for your next testifier? It's actually Thaddeus. Okay, so Mr. Pope, please introduce yourself and begin your testimony. Okay, uh, and I also submitted a written statement. Um, my name is Thaddeus Pope. I'm director of the Health Law Institute and a professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. I specialize in legal and ethical issues in end-of-life medical treatment. I've published over 100 articles in this area, including in the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, CHEST, and the New York Times. The bill that you're considering has been extensively tested. A basically identical law has been in effect in Oregon since 1997, in Washington since 2008, in Vermont since 2013, and it becomes effective in California in June of this year. That's 30 years of combined experience, and there's no better or more relevant track record on which to evaluate the bill before you. There are an overwhelming number of safeguards in this bill that control access to aid in dying medication. The patient must be an adult, must be a resident of Minnesota. The patient must have an incurable and irreversible illness anticipated to cause death within six months, must have decision-making capacity, and that must be confirmed both by an attending and a consulting physician. And if either suspects that the patient is suffering from impaired judgment, they must refer the patient for mental health counseling. The attending physician must fully inform the patient of her alternative options. The bill requires two signed written requests that must be witnessed, must be separated by at least 15 days, and they must be made by the patient herself. This cannot be done through an advanced directive, healthcare agent, surrogate, or guardian. And finally, once the patient obtains the aid in dying medication, she must ingest it herself. And that's why this is aid in dying, not euthanasia. And these are the same safeguards in Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and California. And multiple independent studies have uniformly concluded that they are effective and that there has been no abuse. The health authorities in Washington and Oregon have collected decades of data. What does that show? Very few patients use the law. Last year, 132 Oregonians ingested aid in dying prescriptions. That's less than one half of 1% of the Oregonians who died last year. And the demographics of that narrow population show that aid in dying is not being foisted on minorities or on the vulnerable. Instead, it's overwhelmingly used by educated, insured white cancer patients. 99% had health insurance, 97% were white, 90% were over age 65, and 72% were college educated. These patients did not, not use aid in dying as an alternative to hospice. Over 92% used it with hospice. And that's why one third who, of the patients who get aid in dying prescriptions never ingest them. The bill provides opt-outs to accommodate physicians who have an objection. But that doesn't mean that participation will be concentrated in just a few physicians. For example, the 218 prescriptions written last year in Oregon were written by 106 different physicians. And finally, opponents point to Belgium as evidence of a slippery slope. So, for example, some Belgians have obtained aid in dying who were not terminally ill. But this argument is misplaced. Belgium is a very different culture. Assisted death was already prevalent there before the practice was legalized. So Belgium never slipped from being less permissive to being more permissive of aid in dying. Belgium was always more permissive. And there's no evidence of slipping in the United States either. No U.S. state has ever enacted legislation with different, fewer, or weaker safeguards than in this bill. And there's no evidence 
that physicians have failed to comply with the safeguards. Not a single criminal case, not a single health licensing board action. And neither has Disability Rights Oregon, the state's protection and advocacy system, received any complaint of exploitation or coercion of any individual with disabilities. More than two decades ago, this legislature confirmed the right of Minnesotans to refuse life-sustaining treatment. And every day, every day, chronically and critically ill patients across the state hasten their deaths by withholding or withdrawing dialysis, mechanical ventilation, or other interventions. But some terminally ill patients are not dependent on any such technologies. This bill gives those patients the same freedom to control the manner of their death. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Polk. Thank you, Mr. Polk. Um, would you like to call your next testifier? I, I could do it for you, but if you want an order, a certain order, I would encourage you to do that.